Hey everybody, today I'm doing a bit of a pointless video really by talking through my top 10 games of 2021 pretty prematurely and the reason I say that is because a lot of the big titles that I've been most anticipating are not widely available in the UK yet so I've yet to get them to my table. So the games I'm talking about which I'm pretty confident I will like to, to love really, um, these are games like Watch, um, We've got Hadrian's Wall I've yet to play, a Golem I've yet to play, Messina uh, I've yet to play, a Boone Lake, Ark Nova, Gutenberg, a Cascadia. Um, so yeah, absolutely ton of these games, even games like Tabanusi I've yet to get to my table and of course always um, hotly anticipated for me. But despite that I still have 10 games that I recommend here, ones that I really enjoy and some of these no doubt will probably stay on that definitive top 10 list when I get round to it in a few months time when I actually get those games played. But I thought I'd do the, the list regardless, you know, strike when the iron's hot and get this video out there, um, hopefully just to put a bit more spotlight on some of these games. But let's get started on the list. Before I do, I just want to give a shout out to kienda.co.uk who sponsored the show. So if you live in the UK and you like board games, it's a great website to visit. But uh, let's get started at number 10. So at number 10, I have Maharaja, uh, which is actually a reprint from an older Kramer and Keeson game of the same name. This one is um, an area control style game um, with some similarities of some of their classics. You know, Wolfgang Kramer, famous for making games like El Grande. Uh, this one has, again, some similarities to games like that. However, this one you are programming your actions on this action wheel and then basically trying to plan ahead because you know where this Maharaja is going to visit, or at least you've got a good idea where he's going to visit as the game develops. And then you want to get into there, you want to build these shrines and temples in order to get influence and get points. This game also has a really great use of um, unique player powers, so um, at any time in the game you have a power that nobody else has, but you have control to change that in and out and swap with other players and stuff, just to give you a small advantage in different parts of the game, so I really did like that. Um, additionally, I like the kind of route building element of this game as you're connecting these cities together to make travelling more efficient and things. Um, just a really well-rounded game that I recommend. I suppose the only reason why this one maybe wasn't higher on the list or wasn't kind of in that top tier Kramer and Keystone games for me is because it lives in the shadow of so many greats. So, you know, if you're looking for a great area control game, this one this one is there in its own right, but it's always going to live in the shadow as those greats, as I said, like, like Mexico, like El Grande, and so on. So, still a really good game, um, and a kind of a, a warranted number 10. So that is Maharaja. At number 9, I have Tumbletown, which I think is a bit of an unsung gem. Um, a very family-friendly, dice-driven game, as you are uh, drafting these cards, and then these cards will let you roll dice, and then you're using these dice in order to build buildings. So all these different cards um, are kind of like a little br blueprint of a building that you need to build, um, and they'll have different kind of restrictions on them, which might say, you know, you need two of these colours and two of these colours, or you need um, to have a um, consecutive run of numbers in terms of pit values in order to construct those buildings. And you're all doing that to get points, but I also love the fact that as you acquire more and more of these buildings, you have more control to manipulate those dice um, as the game develops, just to get the numbers that you particularly want. It works very smoothly. Um, I think this one is a little bit let down by some of the production choices. You know, the artwork isn't the most, um, it isn't the most slick looking, it isn't very polished, um, but the gameplay itself, I think lends itself to a game that could be massively successful if more people knew about it. I believe this is from the same designer who did Calico. So, you know, he's got some pedigree um, and the game is certainly up to that standard if only more people knew about it. But if you want a family-friendly, dice-rolling, um, kind of little town-building game, which actually physically build a town out of dice, um, then this is certainly one to look at. It feels unique, it feels fresh, and it's a lot of fun, again, for that, that lightweight um, style game for your collection. So I'd highly recommend checking out Tumble Town if that's what you're looking for. At number eight, sticking on the theme of family-friendly games and talking about Kramer and Keesling, this is Savannah Park. So Savannah Park is a really puzzly style game as you have this big um, grid of these hexes um, and each of these hexes, hexes has a different animal tile on them. So you've got like, I think it's five or six different types of animals um, and they're all kind of divided up accordingly in these different tiles. So, you know, some might have a giraffe on, some might have three giraffes on, some might have a giraffe and an elephant on. And the idea is you're trying to for well, each turn, you are picking one of these tiles and moving it to an empty space with the idea of trying to um, kind of put these animals in their individual packs um, and kind of compound them with these uh, watering holes because if you 
and multiply the animals with the watering holes. That's how many points you're going you're to get for that particular animal type. And of course, at the end of the game, who's got the most points is going to win. But this is a really thinky game. It almost reminds me of like a, a grand sliding puzzle where you, you know, create a gap here, which you're used to put this animal in, and you're constantly creating space and managing that space in order to be as efficient and as point constructive as you can. But so accessible. I mean, the, the the bar to get into this game is so, so low. Um, just a really entry level game that's a joy to play. And um, this one's been hitting the table consistently since I added this one to my collection. So I really recommend checking out Savannah Park. At number seven, I have Coco Pelli, um, which I think at the time of this recording is the latest game from Stefan Feld. However, this game almost doesn't feel like a Stefan Feld game as it is card driven. Um, and the idea of this game is that you are playing cards in front of you or even in front of your opponents at times um, in order to get an ability from that card. So these will give you very kind of sometimes minor, but sometimes quite significant powers, which kind of break the, the normal game state. Um, and they'll give you know as long as they're face up in front of you they're going to be active um, however there is kind of a, a nagging tension because you want to be sure to finish these um, powers by placing I think it's three cards at the same time or maybe four cards and as soon as you do that you'll grab the points tile or a points tile of that type and those points diminish as the game goes on so it really is a, a balancing act of how long are you going to exploit those powers to um, how long are you going to grab the points available to you and that just works really well and I think the actual core mechanisms of the game are so simple I think it's just literally just draw cards play cards or basically complete a, um, a ceremony so uh, that's basically the gist of it but I love how clean that core system is it adds so much potential in terms of adding new material new cards and new decks into the game because this game is so variable on what you can play you know the base game comes with a bunch of different decks and you don't use them all each game and if you get the expansion that's just um, multiplied um massively so yeah really enjoy this game and it just flows so nicely and again a completely different direction for a Steffenfeld design so that is Coco Pelli at number seven. At number six I have Free Ride by Freedom and Fries. Uh, this one is a train game so you are as you'd expect probably building uh, train tracks trying to connect these different cities of Europe all together um, and a bit like Ticket to Ride you're trying to fulfill these tickets um, where you're drafting them from this big common supply. You've got a starting point and a finishing point, and then you're physically moving your train up and down these tracks um, to, to complete those contracts and get points. But what I really do love about this game is that as soon as you establish a piece of track, you claim it as your own. And that means you can go up and down that track um, as many times as you want for free. Um, but as soon as somebody else uses that track, they have to pay money to use it, and then it becomes public for all the players to use. Um, however, doing that is going to cost money, and money is points in this game, and a lot of points. So it's a really hard decision to make. You know, Are you going to um, you know, cut those corners and save yourself from wasting loads of turns to build uh, a route around other players' tracks, or are you just going to bite the bullet, pay that money, and go straight to your destination? And that is just what this game is all built on. It's an efficiency puzzle. You want to be making, your, making sure you're drafting cards that... When you finish somewhere, you don't have to travel very far to start your next route. And it's got a nice forward uh, momentum. Um, as the game develops, you get more kind of contracts and you move faster. And, um, you know, I don't really have a game like this in my collection, a very simple route building and kind of you get a train style game. And this one has really fit that niche nicely um, for my personal taste. So, again, another game with a, a very low rules overhead, very clean mechanically, but it just works so, so well. That is Free Ride by Friedman Fries. At number five, I have Furnace. So Furnace, again, that really did receive a lot of hype this year. Um, this is a medium lightweight engine building style game um, with a strong element of bidding. So I really enjoy bidding as, a, as one of my favorite mechanisms, actually. This one, you're gonna have a, uh, um, a supply of cards out there, and these cards are gonna have basically two different bits of information on them. So one is gonna be the actual power that card is gonna grant you if you end up acquiring that card and that'll be kind of um, converting resources into other resources or resources into money uh, and money being the uh, the points in the game or it's actually going to give you straight up resources so in turn you're going to be placing these bidding discs on these cards to try and claim them or even try and claim the resources because only the person who bids the highest is going to get the card but everybody who else bids um, on a lower kind of bidding disc is going to get the resources multiplied by the value of the disc you've played on there so if you end up you know bidding uh, 
using your three bidding chip on there, you'll get three times the resources on there. But you might not want to win the card, you might end up winning the card um, because you bid so high. So it really does have that cool decision there and you have to react to what the other players are doing. And after that, after you've acquired all your cards, you are running this engine full of um, full of cards and again, converting resources, gaining resources and so on, and trying to be as efficient as you can with as little wastage as you can. Very fast game, only takes 30 to 45 minutes to play. And again, another low rules overhead game, but it works so well, so smoothly and so much potential for more material for this game. But at the moment, as it is, I'm really enjoying Furnace. At number four, I have probably one of the biggest hidden gems of the year for me. This is Fruticola. Uh, so Fruticola, a game that really did, um, didn't did come out with a strong start, um, but this one was a Kickstarter campaign from last year, got fulfilled this year. Um, and this is a, a worker placement game with the idea of um, harvesting these fruits and then converting those fruits into jams and then selling those jams for profits. Um, but this game has so many layers of um, complexity. Um, I say complexity, it's more like different decisions you have to make throughout the game because you have a very strict capacity in where you can store these fruits and jams. Um, you have this kind of commodity speculation where the market is constantly fluctuating, going up and down depending on supply and demand. Um, so you want to be making sure that you're you know, buying low and selling high and getting as much money as you can. And I absolutely love the bonuses and upgrades you can get in this game by going to a certain worker placement spot and adding to your engine. It works so, so well. Um, I also love this idea of uh, at the start of each round, you're going to be playing an action card and that action card is going to to determine the initiative of the players in the game. So the lower the card value is gonna mean you're gonna go first and get the, you know, get the priority and the, uh, you know, get the upstart on getting the worker placement plots that you want. But also it's gonna show the actual um, workers you're gonna get throughout the game because there's actually two types of workers in this one. You've got farmers and you've got your standard workers and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. So if you go to certain spots, then you're gonna get bonuses if you use a particular worker type. And on top of that, you'll also get a kind of unique ability um, that only you have throughout the round as well. So I love that extra decision space. And this is just a really tight, concise worker placement game with real uh, tenseness to get to those spots and loads of potential to do what you want and try different avenues and um, to exploit these different bonuses you get. But it is just a wonderful game and um, one that was massively let down by its production. At number three, I have Anno 1800 uh, by Martin Wallace. Yeah, this is also somewhat considered a 2020 game, but it wasn't printed in English until 2021, so therefore I consider it uh, valid for this list. So this is um, a pretty much a tech tree style game, um, obviously with the kind of industrial feel to it, as you'd expect from a Martin Wallace game, as you are starting with very basic resources and then you're using those resources to get a new um, industry and kind of building this whole new network of building boats and traveling abroad and getting more exotic goods and trying to satisfy these people and make them happy to get points. Um, it works so, so well. I love the logical progression of this game as, you know, if you need to build a boat, then you're gonna need the wood, you're gonna need the sails, you're gonna need some, uh, maybe some cannons in order to protect yourself. And it's all logical, so I do love that network. I love the managing of your town where you've only got a certain amount of space to build these buildings. So sometimes you're gonna have to cover things up and kind of forsake certain um, specialities. And it just works so well. It's um, actually surprisingly streamlined considering the um, mass scope here. You know, there's a lot of tiles, loads of different ways and paths to follow, um, but it is boiled down into quite a simple rule set. Um, I do think there are some minor issues with the game. I think it does have some tendency to go a bit too long and sometimes you can end up chasing your tail in this game because um, sometimes when you fulfill these... Um, objectives and feed these people, you're going to end up getting more and more people um, for doing so. And it can it has a bit of a strange game arc is what I'm supposed to be saying, I suppose, um, where, you know, sometimes you feel like you're winning and then all of a sudden you're swamped again in new objectives, but it does eventually sort itself out. But the gameplay itself is marvellous, um, really satisfying, and it certainly does leave you feeling like you've accomplished a lot by the game's end. So that is Anno 1800, another great design by Martin Wallace. At number two, I have Witchstone by Rani Knizia and Martino Chiquiera. This one is a, a bigger design, um, probably one of the biggest uh, designs that I've seen by Knizia for some time now. And this one uses the um, system 
or the mechanism from Ingenious, where you're placing these tiles onto your individual player board and trying to match up these symbols. And the more you match them up, the bigger or stronger version of that particular action you're gonna take. And they're all gonna to correlate to different little mini games on the main board, such as traveling around this pentagram and getting points as you spin and spin, um, kind of going up this magic wand and getting points depending on the different areas in the board. And you're building these roots on this crystal ball and moving these witches around to claim bonuses. Lots of little mini games. I tend to like games like that, but I love this um, this kind of forward momentum of this game. As you can, you're getting bigger and bigger actions. That puzzle aspect of trying to map things out um, efficiently and get these bigger, stronger actions. And I suppose the biggest thing you take away from this game is that cascading domino effect of actions where if you do this action, it's gonna trigger this, it's gonna trigger this, it's gonna trigger this. And this game just has that in spades and is probably one of the best examples of that, again, of that combo scoring that I've ever seen. So I'm loving this game at the moment. Really easy to get to the table because all the actual mini games are simple in their own right, but it just works so beautifully. Uh, that is Witchstone at number two. And finally, at number one, I have another reprint and another Martin Wallace game with Tinner's Trail. So Tinner's Trail, um, again, a reprint of a game from, from yesteryear, but it's been revamped by Alley Cat Games. Looks very nice now. Uh, this one is a, uh, a game about auctioning for these mines. So you're gonna have a bunch of mines um, on the map, and then you're gonna have, sometimes you're gonna know what's in those mines, sometimes you're gonna do a bit of a blind bid. Um, but basically you're looking to get um, minerals from these mines. I think you've got your, your tin and your copper. And the idea is you're gonna be trying to extract those minerals and basically sell them for profit while the market is hot. Um, but I love this idea and this, um, this mechanism of water in this game because the more water are in these mines, the more expensive and the more it's gonna cost you to extract the metal from those mines. And I think that is such a cool system. And then you can end up kind of investing in these different uh, machinery and tools in order to pump the water out of those mines so you can get those um, those metals more um, or cheaper basically so you, you're increasing your profit margins and I love that kind of um, that you know normally I wouldn't like pure randomness and stuff but I actually do like this um, speculation and think you know am I gonna just take a bit of a um, you know throw caution to the wind here and throw a bit of money at this mine and hope there's something good in there or am I gonna always just kind of invest in safe bets where I know I'm gonna get some good profit uh, but it works so so well. I love the um, the scoring system in this game, where at the end of each round, um, you can end. You, well, you have to sell all your metal, but then you can choose to convert money into points. And the earlier you do that, it means that you're going to get a better conversion rate. And the longer you wait and play things safer, you're going to get less points in return. So I do think that's a really cool, risky system, and it just feels really cool. And you feel like a bit of a tycoon when it ends up uh, when you end up putting it off perfectly. Brilliant game, um, scales great from three to five, and um, I think this is an absolute hit, and um, it's been a big, big hit with who I played this one with, and it's gonna be a staple for my collection for some time to come. Massively impressed by Tinner's Trail. So uh, yeah, that concludes uh, this, again, very premature uh, top 10 of 2021. These are all still great games, um, but I'm pretty sure um, once all is said and done, and I've played all those games I listed um, at the beginning of the video, then this list is gonna look very, very different. So of course I will do a list um, when I played those and then give a definitive version. But um, that concludes the video. Um, if you have enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. Additionally, if you wanna go that extra step, I do have a Patreon account where you can back for as little as two pound a month if you wish to do so. Um, and of course, be sure to check out keyender.co.uk. Um, and for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.